Troops clear the area and check the villagers as they come home. Last night, Viet Cong soldiers, their mortars emplaced in this village, timed their fire to synchronize with that of an American battery some distance away. For a time, the Americans believed they were being fired on by their own guns. When the stratagem was uncovered, the Kong mortars were quickly silenced, and this is the result. Why do you burn my house? A villager demands. Why did you let the Viet Cong use it? Is the reply. How can I stop them? And the answer is, where have all the young men gone? The young men are with the Viet Cong and may be lying dead in front of brigade positions now or buried by their comrades in shallow graves. An intelligence corporal, one of three Vietnamese-speaking members of the battalion, asks permission to set up a medical clinic. This is standard practice for the battalion's medical platoon, mostly bandsmen who work as stretcher bearers in the field. In this village, bitter and suspicious, few patients come forward for treatment by the battalion's doctor. But in other villages, many do. And maybe even here, when the troops move on, some will remember that there are soldiers who fight but neither rape nor pillage nor inflict needless pain but try instead to mitigate the misery of war. What happened last night? Nothing. What have you seen today? Nothing. Where have all the young men gone? I don't know. The soldiers are looking for any evidence that will give them a clue to the direction of the Viet Cong retreat, but they find nothing in the deserted villages along the trail. These Chinese-made anti-tank rockets were dropped by a wounded or dying man. Weapons are mostly new and very well-made Chinese copies of Russian arms, treasured by owners who have no use for them now. More than 200 Viet Cong bodies have been picked up and buried, 20 of them killed by the Australians. One Australian has been slightly wounded American casualties are officially described as light. The next to nil casualty rate is counted a stroke of extraordinary good fortune by the Australians. A river running through the Australian lines is more than ordinary good fortune too. Being able to wash and cool off in Vietnam's heat is simple luxury in the field. But iced water and a hot meal in the evening is taken for granted. From day two on, in any fixed location, the meals are brought into the troops as part of the quartermaster's resupply program. Thanks to helicopters and the quality of the cooks, they're the best fed troops in the history of Australian arms. Imagine diggers in the trenches of Gallipoli or along the Kokoda Trail topping off a chicken dinner with a can of cold tomato juice and a fresh apple. And also thanks to helicopters and the skill of the medics, these soldiers are less likely to die of wounds than any in the history of war. When not on patrol or on picket or other duty, the troops spine bash in the time-honoured fashion of soldiers anywhere and hope that nothing more will happen before the operation ends. It is day 10 in War Zone D. The battalion's colonel tells his orders group that the battalion is moving back to its permanent camp at Bien Hoa airfield. The Americans move out tonight and in the morning. The white or light horse go with them. The rest of the battalion stays to cover the extraction of the guns and then lifts out at 14.30 hours tomorrow. By 1600 hours, there'll be nobody left in War Zone D but the Kong. <laughs>